This is The Devil's Guide to Bards, Part 2, Bard 101, Building a Bard. Devil's Delegate here, bringing you the Prince of Darkness's thoughts on D&D 5e Bards. Last time I gave an overview of the class, and now it's time to look at the basic decisions you have to make in creating a bard. Today I'll be talking ability scores, race, and skill choices. I'm going to be looking at best practices for a bard in 90% of cases. Depending on your campaign, your focus might change and there may be something unusual that will really work well. And as always, you just might enjoy doing it some other way. If you like it, you're fine. But if you're not happy, or haven't tried a bard yet, this might help. The devil's assuming that you want to be as effective as possible while keeping your options open. Starting with ability scores. The bard's ability scores are really simple. Charisma is everything. Bards are charisma-based casters, and many of their features are also based on that attribute. How good a bard is with spells is based on charisma. How many inspirations it has is determined by its charisma. Its most important skills are based on charisma, and your style comes from here. With some classes, you might want to hold back a bit on your primary stat to give the other some oomph, or grab a feat. Not with a bard. Don't think of a bard as having a primary and a secondary. Rather, a primary, some tertiaries, and some dump stats. A bard can survive and prosper with low numbers in all five other stats if charisma is high. Not that it wants to, but it can. Get charisma to 20 as quickly as possible. With high charisma, a bard will find answers to any problem that comes up. For the other stats, well, as I said, they aren't that important, but some are even less important. So any spare points should be put into the three defensive stats, that is dexterity, wisdom, and constitution. Dexterity probably comes next, but don't worry too much if it doesn't. Deck saves are reasonably important and very common, and there are multiple dex-based skills, some of which you'll care about. Dex will also affect a bard's armor class, more than on marshals due to light armor, where a bard can add the entire dex modifier. But don't think that's ever going to be a plus 5. Be happy with a plus 1 or 2 at low levels, and a plus 3 later. A high armor class is good, but you've got spells. Also, if a bard uses a weapon, it will be dex-based, but that should be rare. Lastly, but not in importance, dex affects initiative. You need to buff allies and set up controls before your enemies move. Yes, it's nice for an assassin to go first, but they're just doing some damage to a creature. A bard wants to determine the entire outcome of the battle in the first turn, and dex is the easiest way to raise initiative. So no single item with dex is the vital one, but there's so many that it's probably the stat a bard wants second highest. Wisdom is third, but it's close, and it is reasonable to swap it with dex, or lower it below clown if you think you'll be facing many more physical assaults than mental ones. The factor here is the wisdom save. You can't afford to fail one. As I mentioned in my overview, a bard is a controller, which means the bard can't allow himself to be controlled by the enemy. Plus, you're the one getting your team out of trouble when they fail their wisdom saves. There may be no one to help you if you fail yours. There are also a few wisdom-based skills a bard is likely to want to be good at, which also makes wisdom a bit more important. Constitution comes in fourth, and is purely for defense. It gives you hit points and the frequent con saves. Doesn't need to be high, but don't dump your hit points away. Con saves also come up when the bard is damaged to keep concentration on a spell. You may need to boost your con if this keeps happening. Generally, a bard shouldn't be getting hit all the time. For a bard, the final two stats should be dumped. I'm talking eights. Lower if your generation system allows it. You need to get the points to max out charisma and to raise the other three from somewhere. This is where. In most circumstances, it isn't worth it to put anything into these. Now, if I must make a distinction between the two dump stats, intelligence is better for a bard. Failing an intelligence save is devastating, while failing a strength save is unfortunate. There are also some vital intelligence-based skills, but those are best left to someone else in the party. In a party with no wizard or artificer, and only a poorly built rogue, there may be reason to give a higher intelligence to a bard, but that's a specialized build for a special circumstance, and it will weaken the bard generally. As for strength, you don't need it, and if you don't have it, it will keep you from making poor decisions later. So for a standard array, the devil suggests Charisma 15, Dex 14, Wisdom 13, Con 12, Intelligence 10, Strength 8. Swapping Dex and Wisdom, if you like. For Point Buy, Charisma 15, Dex 14, Wisdom 14, Con 12, Intelligence 8, Strength 8. If you think you'll be well protected, raise one of Dex or Wisdom to 15 and lower Con to a 10. On the other hand, if you feel you might get beat up a bit, you could lower one of Dex or Wisdom to 13, getting a Con of 13, which you'll raise later with the Resilient Feet. The goal of a Bard is to have a 20 Charisma no later than the 8th level ASI. 
That means a level 1 stat of no lower than 16. That's if you plan to put two full ASIs into Charisma. Though usually a bard should start with a 17, so you can use an ASI and one half feet. Normally this means you are counting on a plus 2 bonus to Charisma from your race. So what about race? The devil likes tieflings. A lot. He sees little reason to play anything else. Well, they do make fine bards. But I pushed for him to evaluate a few other things, and after a third drink, he agreed, as long as it's understood that tieflings rule. Now, if you're playing with pre-Tasha's rules, with set stat bonuses for each class, then it is simple. You want a race that gives a plus one, or better, plus two to charisma. If it does that, it's okay. If it doesn't, it's a poor choice. After that, it is nice to get some feature for the few areas a bard would like to shore up. I'll get to that in a moment. If you're using the optional customizing your origin rules from Tasha's Cauldron of Everything that allows almost any race to grant a plus two to charisma, then there are no weak choices. Yes, even a Goliath will make a good bard. And I'll be assuming Tasha's rules going forward. Hey, and now you can trade away useless weapon proficiencies for useful tool ones and choose just the skills you need. Nice. Really, once you've got that plus two to charisma, you've got what matters from your race. So take anything you think is fun. But all right, I'll try to be more helpful. What does a bard need from a race besides that charisma stat bonus? Well, he doesn't need anything, but he might want a couple things. Firstly, defense. That could be an armor boost or help with saves. Then a bard is restricted by the low number of spells he can know, so extra spells are nice and cantrips are particularly sweet. Finally, since he is so good at skills, an extra skill or two, or a tool, is a plus. Though that's a smaller factor since he's taken the best skills already, most anything else doesn't matter, and anything connected to melee combat is a waste. But before choosing the best races, there's another issue. Are you using Mordenkainen Presents Monsters of the Multiverse? Because it changes a lot of races. Nerfing of races in that book has little effect on the bard, but several of those that were buffed are clearly better now for bards. Assuming you are using the new book, there's still a question. Are you applying the Monsters of the Multiverse changes to the races Watsi hasn't updated yet, and won't for a year? You see, we're at one of those annoying spots in D&D history, and I've been here before, when the game is being changed, but they're only partway done with publishing the changes. It's pretty easy to see what changes are going to be passed along to all the classes, like all races that have a 25-foot walking speed are going to get a 30-foot one. The important changes for bards that I'm referring to here are... To a lesser extent, the Trance Trait for Fae, that now allows learning two proficiencies after a long rest, weapon or tool. But for a bard, it's tools. Since Jack of All Trades applies to tools, this is useful. Thieves' Tools, Disguise Kit, or Forgery Kit are solid choices for a bard. And far more importantly, innate spellcasting works differently. Now a creature can choose the spellcasting ability from intelligence, wisdom, or charisma instead of being stuck with a specified casting trait, and any spells gained through a race can now also be cast with spell slots, meaning all of the genocide just moved up as choices for bards, as well as for sorcerers and warlocks. And if you apply these changes to the yet-to-be-changed races, as I do in my game, then several player handbook races have improved for bards. Dark Elves and High Elves stand out. When looking at race, there's custom lineage to consider. It lets you take a feat, and for a bard, that feat should be a half feat for charisma. Applying the regular plus two bonus also to charisma means you can start a campaign with an 18 charisma and be at 20 at fourth level. That's fantastic. It's hard not to just say, do that! But the devil doesn't. However, that sets the bar. A race really needs to give you a lot to come close to that. Now, I started to record this, but found going through all the races takes longer than this video. So I'll save that for the future if people want it. And here jump to the last page. That is, the best ones. So starting with Gnomes, Videlkin, Verden, and Satyrs all get some kind of advantage on Wisdom saves, and sometimes Khan, which takes care of the Bard's most significant worry. The Deep Gnome is the standout here, with advantage on all mental saves against spells, advantage on stealth checks, and two spells. Disguise Self and Non-Detection, that can now be cast with spell slots too. Another top choice is the Fairy. Forget Arakokra, this is the flying race you want. You get Flight, which works with the Bard's Light Armor, and then Spells. Fairy Fire is high on my list of Bard spells, so it's nice to get it for free. And in large reduce is situationally useful. I can't say Druid Craft is an exciting cantrip, but for free, it's an easy way to light candles. Well, that would be your flying choice, except for the combination race of Hexblood Owlin. The Hexblood lineage lets you keep a flying speed and skills from another race, 
so you can get flight and the stealth proficiency from the Owlin, and then add dark vision, telepathic messaging, the ability to view distant places, and the spells Disguise Self and Hex. Hex isn't great on a bard, probably more useful for its ability to apply disadvantage, but Disguise Self is a winner. Moving now into the top tier, we come to the Yuan T. Like the Seder, you get advantage on saves versus spells, downgraded in Monsters of the Multiverse from including magical effects, but it's still fantastic and takes care of the bard's greatest concern. Then, Dark Vision, and advantage on saves versus poison, plus some innate spellcasting. Poison spray is not the damage cantrip I'd most want for a bard, the range is too short. But it is a high damage cantrip, and is technically ranged, so actually nice to have on a bard who doesn't have a high damage cantrip. The friendship with snakes is overly situational, but flavorful, but the spell suggestion has infinite uses. An absolute must-have spell for a bard. Getting a free casting of this, plus not having to take it from the bard's list, are big. The UNT Pureblood has often been considered overpowered, and its minor nerfing in Monsters of the Multiverse hardly changes that. It's the number one choice if you are not applying the Monsters of the Multiverse changes to the player's handbook races. But if you are, then it has competition from the Tiefling! Not a shock, this is the Devil's Guide after all. With Dark Vision, Fire Resistance, and Spells, it was always a good choice. But those spells being castable with spell slots gives the Bard some wiggle room with that very tight known spell list. For general bard goodness, the Dispater, Fierna, and Glazia bloodlines are stellar choices. Granting, Thermaturgy, Disguise Self, and Detect Thoughts. Or, Friends, Charm Person, and Suggestion. Or, Minor Illusion, Disguise Self, and Invisibility. If you think you'll just need a more damaging cantrip than Vicious Mockery down the line, then the Levistus bloodline grants Ray of Frost along with Armor of Agathus and Darkness. And if you're the wizard substitute and must handle utility casting, then the Mammon bloodline helps out with Mage Hand, Tensor's Floating Disc, and Arcane Lock. Any of these will make a fantastic bard. And yes, someone might say the Yuan-T is the clear winner, but I'm not going to say that. So you've got your ability scores and your race. Time to choose skills. As mentioned in my overview video, the Bard is the master of skills. The class grants any three, and background and race will give you up to four more. At level two, you gain jack of all trades, and at both third level and tenth level, a Bard gains expertise with two skills. So which skills do you choose to become proficient with, and which do you leave to jack of all trades? The deciding factors are which are generally more useful, which will the Bard be good at, and which can function well enough with lower numbers. The Devil has ranked them best to least. Starting with Persuasion, your key skill. Make everyone do what you wish, and you'll be good at it. Toss expertise on it right away, and it's almost like a constantly renewing spell, considering all the useful effects you'll get from it. Performance, chances are it's your day job. Admittedly, this has less mechanical worth than some of the others, besides getting you paid, but it's amazing how often this pops up in the game. I've even used this in a dungeon crawl, but it really shows up when you're in cities and towns. This pops up enough that you really want to be good at it, but you can consider not giving it expertise since you will be plenty good without doing so. I would always put expertise on performance for a bard, but it's not necessary. Deception. When you're not using pretty words, you're using lying ones. And since deception is often used in skill contests, you'll want expertise on this. Probably your other third level pick for expertise. Perception. Often considered the most important skill in the game, it isn't in my game, that's Arcana. And it won't be for a bard, that's persuasion, but it is common and valuable. And with expertise, you'll be good at it. However, its value goes down the more characters in your party that have it. So if there's wisdom-based characters in the party, and they will always take it, then this drops. If you're running with a cleric, ranger, and rogue, who needs perception to find those traps, then you might skip it altogether. Insight. Very useful before you use persuasion and deception, but it does depend on your DM. If you're never going to see social situations, or your DM doesn't do much with skills, then this drops down the list as it's harder for a player to introduce uses for insight than it is for the next couple skills. Stealth. You draw all attention to yourself, but sometimes it's good to hide. Since stealth is involved in contests, this is a reasonable choice for expertise, assuming your party or DM makes perception and insight less crucial. Acrobatics. Your physical skill. You can get by without it, but there are uses in combat, mainly for escaping, and adventuring, mainly for avoiding, and you'll be decent with it. And that's seven skills. Few bards are going to have more skill proficiencies than that, except lore bards, so you're done. But I'll keep supplying the ranking in case you end up with more skills somehow, or some of the earlier ones don't work in your game. Intimidation. This ranks this low because it overlaps with persuasion. Having both is redundant, and persuasion has more uses. However, if you prefer Intimidation, you could take it instead and then give it expertise. Arcana. 
Someone needs it, but bards are not that bright. You'll never be great at it, and it's painful to use expertise here to just be decent when you could put it on a charisma or deck skill and be spectacular. But if your whole party is stupid, which is not uncommon, this may be up to you. Investigation. This would be nice if you were sharper. Luckily, rogues pretty much have to take this, so you might be off the hook. Sleight of hand. My favorite skill in the game that has very little practical use. At least bards are good at it. As DMs rarely call for it, take a proficiency in this only if you've got a specific plan for it, where you can be calling out for checks in it. Otherwise, no. Animal handling. The few times this comes up, you probably won't need high numbers, so jack of all trades will do. Survival? Someone else can keep you alive in the woods. And jack of all trades means you can help. History. Books are hard. Your intelligence is too low. Look to making this proficient only if you're making an unusual build, where you have to raise your intelligence, and thus drop your defensive stats and are counting on your party to keep you safe. Religion. Holy books are hard. Same as with history. Nature. Biology books are hard. Leave it to the rangers and druids or somebody smart. Medicine. No, you'll have spells. Athletics. You don't need it and wouldn't be any good with it. You also get three musical instruments. Mostly they are flavor, but as they can act as your magical focus, make sure to choose at least one that you can play with one hand, or easily carry hanging around your neck. So think maracas, tambourine, and a hand drum. Also, an instrument of the bards is the best magical item you can ever get, giving you six or seven additional spells plus castings. So it's nice to be able to play one if you find one, which means harp, mandolin, lyre, lute, bandor, or cittern. Which brings us to backgrounds. Mechanically, what you want from a background is two skill proficiencies, preferably one high on the list I just covered, and one or more tool proficiencies, since you'll be decent with tools. Repeating, Thieves' Tools, Disguise Kit, and Forgery Kit are the best tools for a bard. For the background feature, just look through all the backgrounds for something you like. Something that feels fun and fills out your character's personality. Then choose Custom Background, and add whatever skills and tools both fit it and that you need, giving you the best of all possible worlds for theme and mechanics. Now, if you're feeling lazy, or your DM doesn't like custom backgrounds, then good choices would be Entertainer, Acrobatics and Performance, Disguise Kit, and Musical Instrument. Criminal, Deception, Stealth, Gaming Set, and Thieving Tools. Or the Urban Bounty Hunter. You get to choose two from Deception, Insight, Persuasion, and Stealth. And for Tools, choose two from Gaming Set, Musical Instrument, and Thieves Tools. All of which goes out the window if your DM allows the Strixhaven backgrounds, as those supply added spell lists and a feat that gives you two cantrips and a spell. Prismari has the best skills for a bard, acrobatics and performance, along with a solid attack cantrip. Though I'd recommend dealing with taking some intelligence skills and go lore hold to get an attack cantrip and a familiar, or quandrix and get guidance and a familiar. Likewise, if the Mage of High Sorcery background makes it out of Unearthed Arcana, and your DM allows it, then you'd grab it, as it gives you intelligent skills, but also a feat that supplies a cantrip and two first-level spells. So our bard has its stats, its race, its background, its skills, and its tools. Next, it's going to need spells, feats, its subclass, of course, and seeing if you want to multi-class, at least for a dip. And I'll look at those in separate videos. And the first of those will be the subclasses. So come back for the next exciting episode of The Devil's Guide to Bards, where I'll be reporting the Devil's evaluation of the Bards' colleges.